Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Eden webinars during the uh, European Online and Distance Learning Week. We will start shortly. We're just waiting for one uh, speaker to join us. Uh, meanwhile, in the chat, uh, you can introduce yourself uh, and tell us uh, where are you from. So, minute or two until we find our last speaker for today's session. Okay, so while uh, Irina prepares, uh, while Irina prepares the slides, I will just give the introduction into the uh, session. So, uh, welcome to today's session, which is titled Digitally Enhanced Learning at European Higher Education Institutions state of play and prospects and uh, i'm very happy that today we will have very interesting session presenting the results of the survey which was carried from march to june 2020 by european uh, universities association within the project erasmus project dghe and uh, this is survey which on digitally enhanced learning and teaching and among higher education institutions across the Europe. So uh, I'm certain that information gathered will be of uh, high interest to all of, all of us. Um, coincident uh, uh, with the lockdown and physical uh, distancing, the survey results provide some information on the sector's crisis response, but mainly focus on the status ante and on the plan for the future. So the survey, uh, the survey was open to universities and other higher educations uh, across the Europe. And mostly, uh, almost 80% of uh, institutions which participated in the survey are conventional universities offering mainly on-campus tuition, although the majority of them offered already before the crisis blended and some online uh, learning, usually th through short courses. Um, so uh, today we will provide uh, some insights also how institutions responded to the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, present, we will present some key findings uh, and we will discuss them with the three university representatives so uh, let me present my uh, speakers uh, today. Um, we uh, have planned to have Michael Gable from Uni Univer European University Association. He is late. I hope he will uh, join us. But as the representatives from the universities, we have Irina Volmgevicene, Director of Innovative Studies with, with uh, Vitatus Manus. Magnus University. She's uh, Eden former president and my dear friend. Irina has been working among leading researchers, uh, methodology specialists and education policy makers in the area of technology enhanced learning development uh, uh, in Europe, in Lithuania since 1997 and having established the national network for distance and e-learning in the country, then Lithuanian Distance and e-learning Association in 2010. She continued as a leader in research and project work to promote the development of technology enhanced learning in Lithuania and Europe, introducing many innovations in different education organizations from school vet, adult learning and higher education uh, sector. Second uh, panelist uh, speaker um, of today is Philip Emplit, full professor at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Uh, Philip holds a PhD in science and is tenured professor of applied physics at both the Ecole Polytechnique de Bruxelles and the Solvay Brussels School of Economic and Management of the Université Libre de Bruxelles. He used to be vice director there for teaching and learning affairs affairs and director of teaching and learning center. He presently starts a position of academic responsible for quality unit at the uh, Université Libre de Bruxelles, Polytechnique de Bruxelles, and in the frame of teaching and uh, learning and teaching initiative of European as University Association, Philip acted as a chair of a thematic working group on evidence-based approaches to learning and teaching. And the last, uh, not least, uh, our speaker is Marta Zhuvic, Vice-Rector for Student Studies and Quality Assurance at the University of Rijeka in Croatia. Uh, 
Um, she received her PhD in field of biophysics in 2002 from the University of Zagreb. Uh, she worked as a research academic teacher at medical faculty, faculty of engineering and Department of Biotechnology at University of Rijeka, and she established the University IT Academic Academy and the e-learning center. She published 41 original scientific papers, participated in 12 research projects, and authored two university textbooks. Since this year, she's a member of European University Association Learning and Teaching Steering Committee. So uh, I'm certain that uh, we will uh, have quite interesting uh, discussion today on the results. Um, uh, Irina, I think that uh, as a panelist, uh, you can uh, go down there to sc share screen. Yes. And, yes. and then you can share the, the presentation. So please, uh, can you step in and start with the presentation? And then we will... Um, after the, uh, each slide, we will open discussion. I ask the uh, participants to join uh, with their comments and uh, their questions in the Q&A so uh, that we can have a joint uh, discussion on the results uh, presented uh, regarding in, in this uh, survey. So, Irina, please, floor is yours. Uh, so, uh, Sandra, I just saw that Michael is oh, in yes. the room, and I'm so okay. happy <laughs> that uh, I was wanting uh, just to share with you that uh, Nobody would introduce better the work than Michael. So please, hello, Michael. How are you? Are you ready to uh, move on? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, I had some difficulties getting in. Uh, okay. So uh, good afternoon, good. everybody. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So I guess it would be more comfortable for you if you could then share your screen. I do that. Us. Yep. Okay. Just okay. a second. So uh, we find uh, we found our last uh, speaker. So uh, Michael Gable from European University Association will take over and they uh, give the short introduction in the results of survey. Uh, Michael is director of Higher Education Policy Unit, and also um, he worked uh, for more than a decade in higher education cooperation and development in Middle East, the former Soviet Union, and Asia. Michael, we already described what is the session about, uh, who are the speakers. So now the floor is yours to present the results of the All survey. right, thanks. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yep, good, then I go yep. ahead. Um, so I'm going to present uh, results from, uh, from a survey where uh, we collected data between March and June 2020. So that was the difficult period of time when uh, uh, many of you were in confinement and had to close campuses. Um, the survey targeted institutional leadership and we had quite a good turnout in that uh, we had uh, close to 370 responses from different types of institutions and also from uh, across the European higher education area. So all 48 countries were involved. We have conducted a similar study already in 2014. Uh, so this allows us then to have some uh, uh, longitudinal data, and we also asked quite similar questions in our regular trends reports. Um, this is uh, a pre-presentation, so to say, because the report is yet not is not yet published. We hope to get it out by the end of the month, or probably more likely in December. And all this takes place under the uh, Erasmus project. Uh, uh, DGHE funded by Erasmus, a three-year project, which. Uh, tries to encourage institutions to uh, uh, self-reflect on their digital strategies. Um, so I start here with uh, the results, and I think the idea is that I present that, and then uh, we have a very knowledgeable uh, and experienced panel here so that we can ponder a bit upon the data and see what is the situation in the different high, in specific higher education systems and institutions in Europe. Uh, but there's also an opportunity for you to uh, ask questions or to comment in the chat. And I think Sandra will get us then some of the questions. 
questions. So to start with uh, 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 different uh, provision modes, um, what we found was 75% are using blended learning throughout the institution or in some faculties. Um, that might sound impressive, uh, take into consideration that is before the COVID crisis. In some countries, it's even 100%. Uh, Austria, Belgium, Finland, I don't read them out all. So that might sound impressive, but it's actually not much more than uh, we had already in 2014. So we don't see a big increase here. Admittedly, in 2014, it was already quite high. So we don't really know how to explain that. But something that we can see very clearly is that compared to 2014, it is uh, much more used throughout the institution. So there has been a considerable mainstreaming compared to 2014, where more institutions actually answered that they use it only in some faculties or only through specific projects. So that's on blended learning. Um, asked then specifically about online degree programs, uh, a bit the same story, yeah. We also we had about the same number, about one third of institutions, which already said in 2014 that they offer online degree programs. Um, if we ask them then in detail how 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 much that is used throughout the institution, we found out that this is actually just a few. So we interpret this that institutions are still and will remain uh, conventional universities where students usually come to campus. And that is confirmed by the fact that, again, before crisis, 90% of institutions answered that they have most students on campus. So I think I stop here and... Uh, yes. Yes, thank you, Michael, for this introduction into this slide. I think that it is very uh, uh, <laughs> interesting numbers. Uh, I'm certain that if you do the survey now, today, um, in, in, in relation to the COVID-19, the data would be uh, rather different. But let me ask uh, our um, representatives, university representatives, how these numbers relate to their uh, in institutions. So maybe, Irina, we can start it with you. Um, I know that at Vitatus Magnus University, uh, you are doing quite a number of things regarding the blended and the online. So what is the relation uh, with your data to, to this uh, in the, in the uh, slide? So you know, we are not one of the biggest universities in Europe, but we are the second university in the country in terms of the numbers of students and staff, uh, so we have uh, now uh, more or less uh, 10,000 students. And uh, I can tell you that all, absolutely all uh, um, programs and courses are online. But the question is, of course, always uh, to what extent and what kind of intensity they are online in contacting, uh, in contact and interacting uh, with the teacher and with the students. Mm -hmm. In, in, in terms of accessibility of learning material, uh, lectures, uh, records, uh, uh, tasks, assignments, and assessments. So um, definitely this survey very clearly also corresponds uh, with the um, um, our case, I would say uh, that um, the majority of programs are prepared in a blended way, but the intensity before COVID uh, uh, and the percentage, actually, we do measure our uh, courses to what kind of percentage it is, it is possible to implement it in a blended mode or completely online, it differs. And uh, yes, uh, the target actually was... Um, acceptance, mainstreaming, uh, but also pedagogical innovations. But finally, before COVID-19 uh, and spring 20, we had several, only several programs uh, adapted uh, for online degrees. And those were usually targeting at lifelong learners or people who re-enter higher education. And I think we will speak about it uh, a, bit, a little bit later. Yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. I must uh, um, confess that we have not reached mainstreaming 
meaning nor acceptance to large extent. But of course, a spring case was different. And now we are talking about um, such um, aspects as satisfaction, requirements. So we, we, we immediately move to experience, to reanalyze and readdress it to see where we are and whether we moved with everything or just used video conferencing and other means to, to reach uh, our students. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Let's hear one more uh, opinion, uh, Philip. Uh, what do you think uh, did your universities uh, before the pandemic uh, actually had the mainstream of blended learning uh, uh, or it was already 100%? Sorry, we cannot hear you. Yeah, okay, it's okay, okay now. Yeah. Um, in fact, if if you speak about uh, blended learning as uh, teaching and learning using uh, LMS platform, learning management system platform, like uh, Moodle, for instance, or Blackboard, uh, it's more than 20 years that uh, University Brussels has developed this, and it's now six years that it's uh, legally uh, mandatory for publicly funded higher education institution in Belgium, French part of Belgium. So since six years, all institutions are obliged to give access to all their students to online teaching resources on a learning management system uh, like syllabus, notes, assignments, references, podcasts, and so on. So each course each course of our programs receives uh, yearly automatically a dedicated uh, inter intranet space on the LMS with an access given to teaching staff, of course, but also the student enrolled for the course. So with respect to this, 100% of our course are uh, on the platform. But as Irina said, the intensity of use of this platform is very different from one course to the other one. We also added recently during uh, the last year some additional numerical tools like WooClub. It's a perform performance instantaneous online voting system. Uh, and now during the, the crisis of COVID, uh, Teams and Stream, uh, so video conferencing and uh, video recording management systems for the uh, complete institution. But as we say, uh, if uh, blended teaching and learning is referring to teaching on-site and uh, online, um, it's, it's not in fact a, a, an inst institutional goal, but if it contributes to, uh, to address the objectives and the goals of some courses or program, it will be supported by the, the, the university and it, it's in line with our uh, institutional charter for learning and teaching that we adopted in uh, 2012 uh, in order to, to give some long-term goals for improvement of uh, enhancement uh, of teaching and learning uh, of our university. What I, I wanted to say that we are a comprehensive university and we have a large part of our programs, including laboratory practice, on-field training, training by simulation, learning by projects, internship, and so on. And this is very hard to organize just online. So it means that at this, at this time, it's still considered as uh, uh, activities, learning and teaching activities that will remain on long term uh, uh, with the physical presence of the, the students on site, on the field, in the internship uh, locations. So. It means that where uh, online can be introduced and is something interesting for reaching the goals of the, the course and reaching a better quality of uh, learning, it will be supported. And uh, But we still believe that uh, on, on site experience is often something very important. And what I just want to say that we don't have any online degree, complete degree uh, in our programs. It means in the programs subsidized by the, the public funding because it's not legally authorized at the moment. The only uh, activity that has been developed by our institution is developing some MOOCs. But what I want to say, MOOC, uh, for instance, for my university, represent 10 
10 to 15 courses and we have 3,000 to 4,000 courses in our program. So MOOC is very little part of our teaching activities. Uh, thank you, Philippe. Um, I thought uh, maybe to pass uh, uh, to another slide before giving the floor to Marta, but I cannot uh, 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 stay without uh, asking her to, to share, um, because University of Rijeka has online de de degree program, and uh, it's one of the few in, in Croatia. So uh, definitely you are within this 38 uh, percentage, uh, and this was before the, the COVID uh, pandemic. How was it different to prepare and uh, how teachers and students reacted to this, Marta? Yes, thank you, Sandra. Actually, we had uh, two online degree programs, uh, uh, master's programs, and uh, we can see now that uh, COVID crisis stimulated uh, other, uh, other faculties also. We have now two or three more in preparation. For, uh, for accreditation. Well, the programs were well, well uh, received and uh, our university has some 14, 15 years of uh, uh, blended learning implementation into, into our study programs. But as um, Michael uh, nicely uh, uh, presented, we had kind of reached a plateau where uh, we had some 45% of our courses offered uh, as with the through the blended learning and we couldn't get this percentage uh, higher maybe without making it mandatory and uh, we can see now that this situation produced a completely different uh, setup and uh, since we all needed to go online overnight, uh, we prepared also for this uh, academic year for all the courses to have this situation, as Philippe also said, uh, to for all course teachers to have mandatory, uh, even all, at least basic materials presented on our LMS. It's not our LMS, I have to say. We have uh, this uh, national support. Uh, Sandra comes from the institution that provides national support in Croatia for uh, blended learning. So this is very valuable resource that we are using in Croatia uh, by having all this logistics and uh, infrastructure provided centrally. Thank so you, for Marta. the moment, I will stop. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Michal, before we are moving to the next slide, we have one question, maybe which is I think it's important to answer before going. We have a question from Fortunato Sorrentino who is asking, can you be precise about what you mean by blended? Normally, this means part in the present, part online. So as no. you did the survey, I leave this uh, question to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, uh, we cannot be precise. Uh, I think we are as blurred as anybody else who talks about blended learning. Learning. But uh, I make here the promise that for our next survey, we will become more precise. So I think it's it's no longer useful to ask the question about blended learning. And I think that was his uh, the, the core of his question. Um, we have been using that for a while, but it could mean all kinds of things from people having a very, from institutions having a very elaborated digital uh, learning ecosystem and others just uh, recording lectures and uh, putting them on the website. So we need to get uh, more differentiated there. Yep. Okay, thank you. So let's move on. Yeah, I think that's actually the question is actually a nice uh, transition to um, the next slide, which is about curriculum and digital skills. And I start with curriculum. And again, we don't have good data on this, but I mean, just taking up what has been asked and also what Irina, uh, uh, Philippe and uh, Marta presented is, I, I think a question is really when you use digitally enhanced learning, be it online or be it <clears throat> blended, how transformative is this actually? I mean, how much has this, Marta referred to the uh, COVID crisis, but Philippe and Irina said already, it happened already before the COVID crisis. How transformative has this already been? 
Um, or is this just uh, like uh, we teach now online? It's just a, another medium, but it's actually the same way of teaching. So how, how would you really see the uh, gains, I would say? So that would be the first question, uh, the disruption, the gains, what is changing there? Then the second question is about uh, the digital skills uh, And there we have actually some good data. And as you can see here, it's basically addressed at most institutions. Um, 94% uh, uh, have it specifically to the discipline or the study field. 91% have uh, uh, generic liter digital literacy. Data literacy and safety and ethics is a little bit lower, but it's, it's widespread out. However, if you ask institutions, they say it's not offered to all students or only on specific study programs, or it's a voluntary offer. So it's not really, I would say, fully mainstreamed yet. And we don't know really why that is. Uh, is it because the need is so different or has there not enough attention been paid? And is that probably the step for the next round uh, to make that much more mainstreamed and embedded really into the curricula? So two questions. One is how disruptive is, has been the impact also before the COVID uh, of digitally enhanced learning on the curriculum? And then the second one, uh, how do you see the presence and future of digital skills. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Maybe, Irina, you can uh, start with this uh, curricula uh, disruption. Uh, how often and in what way did you uh, change the curricula uh, in your uh, university uh, regarding the implementation of digital uh, part? Um, I think um, the, the last semester was very illustrative Um, I would compare uh, actually uh, the disruption to, towards education curricula. Uh, I would compare the same phenomenon with the understanding of how uh, global, globalization is perceived uh, by societies. Before uh, spring 2020, we heard uh, many important and interesting um, discussions about how we should be opened towards uh, global issues, global problems in our small and local societies. Uh, at the same time, we thought and we heard that we should also improve and modernize higher education curriculum. But uh, maybe due to our nature, we would always um, try it step by step, uh, thoughtfully, collaboratively, maybe not always collaboratively, but always thoughtfully, and would introduce uh, very small segments of um, digitalization, modernization, step by step. And uh, of course, we are always overloaded with other things as professionals, as practitioners, But there was a small, quite small community of those who would promote digitalizations because it improves uh, pedagogy, let's say, because it, it um, facilitates uptake of networking and collaboration in one another way. And suddenly this disruption, this disruption came. We all became uh, citizens of the global world because we all uh, were faced with the same challenges of pandemia, and we all became faced with the same challenges uh, in higher education, and mainly the need to change curriculum. I think um, European University Association, also Quality Assurance Agency Network in Europe, clearly uh, after several surveys identified two main challenge areas that curriculum needs to meet. Uh, assessment, new types of assessment and new uh, modes of uh, formative assessment in, in our practices and engagement of students. I think in now we are talking not only about moving our lectures online, but the need to change curriculum, to rethink uh, student engagement and to rethink uh, assessment of learning outcomes within curriculum, our priorities. Uh, I'm very happy about it. At the same time, as said that we have, we're so short of time for this, 
But I think this is the main disruption, and I believe that it is coming with a very progressive and positive changes in pedagogies. Thank you. Um, I I will just be uh, adding something adding something uh, to you comment because uh, I know in Croatia that uh, when we had programs which went to a reaccreditation uh, regarding their curricula, mostly uh, institutions try to add some part of the digital uh, in a way, but mostly as, uh, in a blended way as addition to the classroom uh, teaching in order to uh, improve the uh, quality of teaching and learning. Um, so uh, that were, this was not big steps, but these were steps taken before the uh, pandemic. Now I have a teachers who uh, had to move uh, mostly fully online and who are asking uh, how to actually um, work on the pedagogical part uh, and now realizing that they need to change the curricula because the curricula which was previously developed was developed for the face-to-face -face teaching and not for online teaching. And uh, it has now become clear that uh, new recreditation and uh, new curricula should be uh, developed. Uh, so uh, maybe it wasn't so much uh, before, but now I think uh, that the change uh, of curricula uh, will start uh, much more in order to uh, enable teachers to provide quality teaching uh, and learning with uh, curricula which was prepared for the online uh, teaching and learning. Okay, let's see the second part uh, regarding the uh, literacy and the skill. And I think, the Philip, you are just the right person to ask you this question because you were director of Teaching and Learning Center. So how was um, issues related to the skills, uh, 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 the teacher skills uh, uh, at the institution uh, rearranged? Arranged? Uh, was it a compulsory or uh, not? And if uh, which uh, trainings did you provide or in short for teachers? Yes, in fact, in fact, something I wanted to say that uh, this is an ongoing process. It's a long-term ongoing process. As I said to you, uh, we introduced our first uh, learning management system 20 years ago, uh, our libraries. I also directed the, the libraries during a, a part of my career, also adopted massively during the same 20 years period, the numerical, numeric support for database periodics, up to 100% of periodics in some disciplines, books. Um, online process of, for communication are becoming universal in the institution. So it means that I re really have the feeling that the COVID crisis uh, just accelerated the process more than created the process. And it's, it has been uh, really uh, adopted uh, or supported by the learning and teaching center staff in order to help stakeholders to uh, adapt themselves to uh, the situation where the, the use of these tools increased uh, massively uh, during a very short period, during a weekend period, in, in fact, during the time they decide the lockdown and at the, the time we start to work online uh, for teaching and learning activities in March. So I think the new normal situation will be an opportunity to, uh, to uh, think about the, uh, the, the, the introduction of uh, online tools, uh, digital tools, and knowing more than we had before the pros and the cons of the mm -hmm. tools. Uh, before there was a position of some teachers, some uh, teaching staff or responsible of programs that online was not adapted to their programs. No, they have some experience, they develop experience, they, they, knew, they just observe new tools, and uh, some are curious to, uh, to uh, continue to use some way these tools in order to improve, as, has, uh, as it has been said by Irina, uh, improve the quality of uh, the learning uh, experience of the student. This is the goal. In fact, the goal is not improving the teaching activity. The goal is improving the learning uh, quality of our, of our students. So among the, the, the new opportunities, I would just say, for instance, that uh, before this time, uh, having a, a, a student abroad during one of his uh, international exchange program, like Erasmus program, 
was very difficult when he, he had to uh, follow a mandatory course at the university. This becomes possible. Having a, a teaching assistant attending a conference abroad during a part of the year where he, is he has teaching duties was impossible. And now it becomes possible. We can imagine that teaching assistant is giving uh, his, uh, his lecture or his course when being abroad through uh, numerical tools that we uh, experienced. So things are changing and skills are improving. I, I always say that uh, numerical tools have been just tools. It's not a goal, but it, if it can help, uh, even as I said before in, in one of my course, it can help the digital suit can help the student to come back to the, the, the classroom. Some don't come back, do not come uh, to the classroom in the usual way of teaching. Now with these new tools, maybe they will be interested in coming to the classroom and uh, receive the added value of the teacher, uh, which is not just lecturing and uh, giving theory, but discussing with them about the problem. And so that's that would be my my uh, my answer to your question. Okay, thank you. And uh, I, I want to ask Marta as well the same question because I know she established the e-learning center at the University of Rijeka and there she provided some uh, trainings for teachers in uh, digital skills and uh, the situation she you have the Marta before uh, the COVID and how it changed uh, after the COVID started because you also, also had uh, organized quite number of teacher trainings uh, during the COVID so that they are enabled to use digital technologies. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think we, we all have to agree that this uh, COVID crisis produced an irreversible change in higher education. And as any... Okay, we have the freeze on you. Okay, we are losing you a little bit. A new era of higher education and a new set of tools that we have to develop to support it. Uh, uh, in these terms, uh, this uh, change has to focus first on the academics' continuous professional development in terms of not only acquiring digital skills, but also new pedagogies. And uh, we were always stressing this, this part of pedagogy in, in our educational uh, support for the teachers. Uh, we had a, a certain set of educated teachers also before, but now, uh, after the COVID crisis in the springtime, we offered uh, some emergency education for uh, teachers uh, uh, during the summer. And I have to say that we had more than 600 educations uh, uh, finished by our academics during July and August. So it was kind of motivation that we could not see before this uh, situation. Uh, this was really, uh, uh, how would I say, uh, yes, promising for the future. And uh, we think that this uh, year we, we kind of planned to, uh, for the moment, to set up a tool, uh, uh, set the tool, set the whole framework for quality assurance tools to monitor what's happening in this academic year, to get the most out of the suggestions that our academics provided in this situation, and that was use of peer collaboration, helping each other, but also in the same time to have this top-down level of university management taking care of continuous professional de development of teachers of, uh, in, in terms of enhancing their teaching, uh, teaching competencies in digital surrounding. 
Thank you. Uh, going back to you, Michael, I just would like to ask our participants if they would like to share in chat their experience regarding uh, the topic which uh, we present here. So we would like to hear from them if they can would like to share uh, their experience as well uh, with the question. So, Mark, Michael. Uh, I'm going back to you now. Yeah, that's good. Um, and I probably just to confirm what Marta just had said, I mean, I don't have that on my slides, but peer collaboration, peer exchange turns out indeed almost like a remedy to quite a few of the problems that you have. And it's also often the answer for staff development um, at institutions um, and also for the transformation work that has to be done. Mm -hmm. Just to be clear, I mean, the data that I produce here, the percentages are actually about um, whether this is offered to students. Okay. Yeah. So has that been included into the curriculum? We see at some institutions there are extra courses offered to. I think what is behind it that uh, we cannot assume that all students are really prepared uh, to deal with all the uh, these digital issues. I mean, there's the frequently quoted assumption that they were born digital natives, but we know that this doesn't really uh, say much. Um, and the question is really, is that something that you consider now when you design curricula or when you offer your uh, course? I mean, it may have to do with uh, the disciplinary skills that you need for your particular field. I think that's probably an obvious one, but uh, there are also more general issues as I have then detailed here, like digital literacy, uh, safety, and uh, also the ethics issue, which we know, which we are usually pointed to when things go wrong, you know, when you have kind of mobbing or stalking or all kinds of uh, plagiarism and, and, and. So just the question, um, have you found a way on how to address that at your institution or is that just done by everybody almost automatically and it's not a problem? Okay, so uh, are we going to move now to the next slide? Good. Well, this is about quality assurance. And I think that was one of the slides that uh, surprised us a little bit. So uh, what you can see here in the pie chart is our, the response that we got to internal QA. And as you can see, it's about, uh, it's a bit more than half of the institutions which have internal QA in place, which covers um, also digital provision or digitally enhanced provision. That's good in that it is 22% more than it was in 2014, so clearly an increase. Um, it's not so good in that um, it, it, it raises the question, what are the other half of the institutions do? I mean, do they provide digitally enhanced learning? And this is not quality assured. So I think that's uh, that's my first question here. I come later on to uh, the uh, external QA, but probably we start with this. Have you any views on that uh, from your systems, from your institutions? Yeah, okay, maybe Irina, we could start with you, but if we have uh, from attendees uh, some examples uh, uh, from their institution, we would like to see them in the chat as well. So maybe Irina, you could start here. Yes, I think uh, the question that uh, higher education institutions might um, continue to have is what is the difference between the uh, quality, existing coalition strategies and the ones that would address uh, digitalization or technology enhanced learning integration into, into an organization. And uh, that was the question that we also addressed through many years. Uh, in Lithuania, a quality assurance agency, um, the Center for Higher Education uh, Institute, quality assurance, no, sorry, quality assessment, uh, even had the national project um, many years ago, maybe 15 years ago, uh, to see if uh, existing, um, so this is, sorry, Michael, for external things, but still, uh, if existing standards and guidelines uh, need to be updated with something that is required by distance education. And then they addressed institutions, and institutions had to... Uh, review existing uh, quality assurance strategies. And actually, I think it needs some time uh, to, 
to 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 achieve uh, the level when you uh, can make a decision uh, with confidence that yes there are things that are different as an example if we go through uh, the activity areas of higher education institutions that are related with the studies we have the designing and developing developing of uh, programs programs uh, consist of courses um, courses are visible in a completely different way uh, in uh, virtual learning environments and digital spaces as they are in the audiences. If we go on the course level, we only through practice and experience see that um, they have different ways of um, communication. Uh, first of all, communication on what is expected uh, from students. Teachers usually explain it in the audience, but when we move to digital spaces, we need Im immediately to provide additional information for students. On management of the learning material and even uh, learning design, uh, ass assignments, assessment uh, strategies, they need to be presented in a completely different ways. And we need some kind of standard or rules or regulations to be communicated uh, internally. So I think it needs time. And now I, I prognose, uh, uh, my hypothesis is that this need will um, rise. Uh, now we refer to two uh, possibilities. One, to use um, uh, benchmarking models or frameworks and tools existing uh, for technology enhanced learning integration into organization. Another way would be to see how where we are at the moment and what we need to achieve and to, to find uh, to, to try to find our own way. So I think um, it the reason behind it is the fact that we need a discussion and we need to identify the items that differ uh, from regular practices when we when we change uh, our curriculum and our teaching and learning practices in higher education institution. And I, I know that some questions were left behind uh, that Michael asked related with the ethics um, and safety and other things within institutions. I think these um, go through the same way. Um, we naturally accept under the code of ethics uh, that we cannot do something that is not appropriate. And when we start discussing, for example, academic integrity in our days or ethics online, um, we still have a discussion whether regular uh, um, regulations and rules and agreements satisfy the new practice or not. So I think those who decided that not, they, they designed internal strategies and others will do it in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Uh, maybe, Michael, we can move to the second question here in your slide uh, you planned. Yes, um, and um, yeah, and thanks for, uh, probably I, I share my explanation here. I, I think Irina is right. It takes obviously time to take it up. Um, nevertheless, given also that uh, QA regimes are usually quite strict, uh, we were just wondering how do you get away with that <laughs> in the current situation. Um, one explanation that we actually had is that the um, use uh, at individual institutions of digitally enhanced learning is um, not so uh, no not so wide that uh, one has the feeling that the that it needs extra QA. I mean, this is what we had seen already in 2014. It was rather fragmented, you could say. Uh, so you get away with that. But one explanation is also that uh, in some systems, you might not be formally allowed to use blended or online learning. And we know that a bit anecdotally that, uh, for example, student learning only counts that came up now also in the 
COVID crisis, it's only possible when students are on campus. So they are not allowed to do distance learning, which would also prevent you to use some of the benefits that blended learning or the possibilities that blended learning brings. And I think we have an indication here in when we asked institutions about what they see as main obstacles for digitally learning and teaching. And as you can see, it's only 11% that see uh, external QA in EHE average, uh, so in European average, as an obstacle. But then in individual countries, and I just picked up here too, uh, it's actually much more. Yeah, We have Albania and Spain here, uh, Spain with one third and Albania at 60%. So I, I think that that gives an indication that there is a problem at the systems level with the external QA. We also know that from the discussions that we had in the Bologna follow-up group on digitally enhanced learning, where some countries, uh, in particular, but not only in Eastern Europe, were a bit concerned that if we basically recognize it as a as uh, learning and teaching with just other means yeah, and open the door to it, uh, that this would uh, result into challenges uh, regarding uh, QA and also fraud. And I just wanted to point you here to a recent statement that the E4 group, so the organizations of the universities, my organization, the colleges, the quality assurance agencies and the European students has done, where they make clear that the European standards and guidelines that Irina had also mentioned also extend to digitally enhanced learning. Uh, they just have to be, and this is what Irina said, they have to be properly applied and you have to think what that actually means then. So any comments on this? Yes, uh, uh, maybe Marta or Philippe would like to, to comment on this. On maybe my not at the moment, we can proceed. Okay. okay. And maybe just wanted to say uh, one, one word about external QA and any QA process in a university. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's universal, but it's uh, really common uh, in, uh, in our country that QA process is sometimes considered or often considered by academics as uh, an additional administrative task to a daily already heavy agenda. And um, so it's not really popular among the academics. And it's strange because, in fact, if you think about it, the Q, QA process are based of, on collection of evidence. And the goal is to uh, improve the quality of uh, the, uh, the teaching and the, the, the learning experience of our teachers and, and, and students. So it means the, the, the way to uh, organize QA is very similar to what the, the way we organize research activity. So the, the reason why academics are skeptical with respect to QA for me is uh, often that the, the data collected for QA process are not easily accessible for the, the learning teaching stakeholders just for the administration of the university. And therefore, these data are not recognized in general as high value information for designing new courses or curricula or implementing new initiative in learning teaching. So we have to, to think about the accessibility of this data uh, and of all data uh, that could help uh, people to improve the quality of uh, uh, learning and teaching uh, including the digitalization dimension, of course. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Michael, we have one question. I think we can put it related to this uh, slide here in Q&A, uh, asking from Andrea. She says, do you think that online exams will be enough to evaluate the students? I think that it is in, in relation to moving fully online within uh, the COVID uh, crisis. So uh, maybe if some of the uh, panelists would like to answer uh, this question. Do we have some volunteers here? What was the question? I didn't understand. Question it. is, is something, is online uh, exams enough to evaluate uh, the students? Uh -huh different type of evaluation of the students online. Uh, you can ask 
a student to uh, produce something, a, a written document mm -hmm. that I put online or a, a, a portfolio, as, as was discussed yesterday during the meeting, or it could be also oral exams online. Uh, it's very different uh, to organize this kind of exams uh, and to organize multiple choice exams as uh, has been organized in some of our large classrooms last year. So I think this online is too short. Uh, yes. Some kind of uh, online assessment can be very, very informative and very uh, aligned to the high level objective that we, uh, we have for some uh, teaching activities. But some of them are really uh, questionable. So uh, let's, let's just uh, say that most of the uh, online exams are not multiple choice exams. And, and uh, this has been has to be discussed, of course, in, in the institutions. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, there is also formative uh, uh, evaluation of, mm. of the student. And uh, definitely the online exam it can be an essay, for example. So it's uh, also different. So, yes, there are different choices uh, of, on that. So, Michael, maybe we can move on to yeah. the next slide. Just to comment from our side, what we saw is that you can, of course, have bad online exams, but you can have all to bad exams on campus so uh, and i think also to just to support what philip uh, philip said about qa in general i think it still has this uh, bad reputation in a way and as ua we have been promoting uh, quality assurance culture for for many mm -hmm. years uh, and uh, indeed linking it closer to the uh, enhancement of learning and teaching i think that's really a good opportunity to uh, to bring it forward yeah Okay. Good. Um. I may add just a small comment uh, because this uh, online student assessment is really a hot topic and everybody is asking uh, what to do with this online assessment. I, I really think that this COVID crisis is um, something that will promote new quality in student assessment and uh, some improvement in assessment strategies all over our universities. Yeah. Because uh, on-site fraud is also happening, but teachers are fooling themselves uh, uh, that this does not happen. And suddenly they are, they are uh, furious about this <laughs> online assessment as this will be, this will be a fraud. So I, I really think, and going on with the trends, some trends in higher education towards no assessment at all, meaning no uh, this normative assessment by tests and so on that uh, we will we will achieve a new quality in assessment strategies and move more towards this uh, as Sandra pointed formative assessment personal student achievements assessments and so on and so on so i hope this this is really a positive change that will bring us to to a new new level in quality I think that summarizes it nicely, uh, Marta. Probably one last point on this, both for the assessment and for the learning. One factor that comes, of course, in is that um, um, the conditions that students are facing on off campus come much more to play. Yeah. So when you have them on campus, you have them all in the same situation. And as we have seen uh, also for the learning itself, uh, that's a different thing. So I think we all learned a lot about how students actually learn outside of the university where the good part of the learning takes place in these days and in what situation that actually takes place. Okay. I'm, whoops, sorry, that was one too many. Yeah, I'm moving on uh, more to the things that can actually be done or enhanced through digitally enhanced learning and teaching, uh, lifelong learning uh, and also social inclusion. I think that was really interesting uh, in this round. We found this much more emphasized than we saw it in 2014. An explanation is that institutions have become more aware of what they can actually do with it. So you can see that 48%, um, almost half say that digitalization has contributed to major transformation in widening access. About the same number sees this as a way to reach out to new learner groups. Uh, Philippe uh, mentioned already MOOCs. Um, 
We also asked them in 2014 about MOOCs, but in 2014, there, this reaching out to new learner groups was there, but not so prominent. So this has really gained in importance for institutions here. And then also something that is very interesting that uh, we know that already for some years that there's a growing demand that most institutions see uh, for short courses, so not degree courses, that are provided in blended mood. This is what 65% see, uh, but also online, 53%, but also 44% just on campus, so in a, in a conventional course. So just as a complement, probably partly also to a, as a replacement um, to the degree programs that are traditionally offered by institutions. 65% confirm that they uh, uh, target mainly match, mature and adult students. And uh, then you can see also that it has really become a uh, uh, digital digitalization has really become a priority also for generally for enhancing social inclusion, lifelong learning, and, and, and. So interesting developments. We are asking us where that comes from. Is it that digital brings all these opportunities along? Or is it not also because institutions are much more under pressure to respond to um, changing economic, uh, demographic, and also social uh, conditions. And it is also much more inclusion and lifelong learning are also much more emphasized at policy levels. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. So uh, we see that uh, percentage uh, are interesting, uh, definitely. Uh, and that when more and more uni university institutions are widening uh, access for digitalization and finding a, it as a strategic uh, development priority, uh, whether it is for uh, competitive uh, things, you know, like to be uh, uh, present in the international area. Uh, to get the uh, international students, whether to to enable the the accessibility to all the students uh, in, in their country uh, as well. So um, uh, I'm asking the volunteers who would like to comment uh, on on these percentages uh, in the slides. So uh, let me see. I can start uh, with, okay. the, with the examples uh, from mm -hmm. um, my country and my university. In Vito das Magnus University, we have two environments, digital environments, one for formal degree programs, another for non-formal, uh, open and flexible learning opportunities. The first big surprise came um, uh, maybe five years ago. We, we, we have uh, these two environments for more than 10 years now, but the first surprise was five years ago when we were uh, preparing the report uh, for the rector and we uh, received statistics uh, from formal degree program environment that our community members, teachers and students log in to their uh, curriculum, to their courses, which are not online courses, but are blended, only blended, and in majority of cases, uh, to very small intensity, that they log into their courses from more than 109 countries or 10 countries in the world through the semester, which demonstrated that they have very, very uh, big uh, uh, scope or uh, mobility. And then we started um, uh, questioning our, our academic uh, community about that. And that was the fact, uh, because we had numbers from international department uh, and other things. And we saw that, well, uh, students access, and we started even introducing requirements for our teachers to leave the records. Uh, the, the slides, the theoretical references that are used in the traditional conventional classroom online for those who were not able to be present in, uh, in our face to face contact classes. The second uh, very positive surprise was that um, actually 
the, the vast majority of lifelong learners uh, from the country and from diaspora, which is in the outreach uh, and reaches until the United States and, and, and Australia, they join non-formal uh, and short course possibilities through non-formal uh, portal, which is called Open Studies. Um, and uh, the reason for that is that they did not feel prepared for higher education to re come back to, to rejoin formal studies in higher education. Uh, but all um, the majority of um, uh, programs, they offered non-formal courses in the, in the open studies way. So the society members, our diaspora members could start uh, some courses from formal curricula and then to have them recognized in, in the formal curricula if uh, national uh, entry requirements for higher education allowed. And now we are in a very hot discussion uh, with the universities in the country that we sometimes overestimate entrance requirements while well, open universities have low or none of the entry requirements, but very high requirements for the graduation. And we have the opposite way. So what I wanted to change is that I completely um, uh, I'm completely ready to illustrate this percentage with the, with the national perspective and institutional perspective. And yes, our students changed. They are mobile, uh, they, they are working, they are employed in the majority of, 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 of cases. So we have a different uh, economic uh, situation, social situation now. And uh, without uh, digitalization, uh, we would cut off a lot of possibilities indeed. Thank you, Marta. Uh, would uh, Philippe, Marta, would you uh, think, Irina, Marta, would you like to comment? Uh, and then mm -hmm. Philippe? Maybe I can present uh, just shortly uh, the framework for lifelong learning that we have at our university and uh, what this situation produced with this. Uh, well, some 10 years ago, we started to uh, credit uh, lifelong learning programs offered mostly to the community. Uh, to our environment from the university. But more and more, we use this track uh, to offer also to our students some interesting programs. And uh, then we developed this uh, recognition of prior learning framework through which the students can apply for these programs to be recognized within their study programs if it matches their cu curriculum learning outcomes. <clears throat> so more and more all these programs are uh, uh, now are transferring to blended or completely online. And uh, I think that this could be a good starting point to, to develop so-called micro-credentials in the future that are also a hot topic at the European level at the moment. Okay, thank you. Marta, Philip, would you like to add something? to this topic not really on this topic because um in fact the long long life learning process or policy is very dependent on the faculties you know the you know university because it's not funded so um, okay. it's difficult to to give a, a global picture okay thank you so uh, michael uh we have no questions on this from the yeah. audience so we can move uh, on yeah I, th I think i just take one more point on this also because marta mentioned i mean philip uh, gave one of the indications, I think, why it is also difficult to talk about lifelong learning because it's so differently organized within institutions and is of also not not really visible oft as, often as one of the provisions that the uh, university offers. We know that also from our data that in many institutions, uh, in some systems, it's really fenced off from the regular provision through different QA regimes, different funding rules, mm -hmm. sometimes also taught by different uh, staff than the regular university staff. Um, just to pick up on what Marta said about uh, the micro-credentials, I mean, the growing demand here for short courses, that's a very, uh, that's a very, I would say, diverse uh, uh, um, 
mix, I think, that institutions have there in place. Our impression is some of it exists already for a long, long time. It has different purposes, as it has also been described. It could be for um, students, it could be for teachers, a lot of for staff development inside of the university. But indeed, some of this also addresses um, uh, learners from outside of the university. And while we have no I, not not the feeling that this puts in question um, the traditional degree approach, which is still, I think, what most students who graduate from school and go to university are after. We can clearly see that this could be a potentially very important way of providing lifelong learning or additional for those who are already in the workforce or uh, also for those who are studying and need an extra shot uh, on a particular skill or discipline. So I'm just asking because Marta mentioned it's very, it's very uh, high on the political agenda uh, at the European level at the moment. The European Commission has an expert group on this. The Commissioner has emphasized it on several occasions. Um, and it's also a, a key priority at some uh, national levels. We know about emerging national platforms. There's also been a European platform being announced. In, and it, last but not least, it's also something that is emphasized in the framework of the European University Alliances, uh, which were many of them trying to set mm -hmm. up uh, micro-credentials provision. Have you any views on that? Has there been a discussion at your institutions? Would that be a strategy or is this something that you're looking into? You're asking me? <laughs> one of you, one of you four. <laughs> <laughs> if not, we it's can not just yet, we uh, and, and the audience as well. If somebody has a, has a view, uh, our that. university is a part of one of the European alliances, the TUFA alliance, and uh, we are trying to develop the framework for micro credentials. But we we are only only at the starting point. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Good. Then I. I can just add that tomorrow we will have session on micro credentials. Okay. So uh, I might those interested in this topic can tomorrow follow more about that. Yeah. Let's move to another theme, uh, internationalization and mobility. Uh, there we got a rather positive feedback from the institutions. I don't show that here, but basically we got confirmation that uh, digitally enhanced learning and teaching is very useful in the international context for exchange and collaboration with international partners, but also asked about the prospects uh, five years ahead. Um, uh, you can see here, uh, most of the institutions confirm this to be one of their development priorities. So 86% see it as a means to enhance outreach and learning provision for international students, uh, and about the same number for collaboration with uh, other higher education institutions internationally. And there are also 77% who see this as a replacement for physical mobility uh, uh, with virtual mobility and online meetings. Any views from your institutions? Are there any big initiatives planned? I mean, it must be particularly interesting now also in the COVID situation because we can't have much physical mobility at the moment. Yes, I'm opening the floor to maybe Irina, Philip. Would you like to share something? Yes, I, I'm very positive about virtual mobility and uh, with, the, with the experience that we had in several consortia in the past, um, uh, we worked uh, with the projects on virtual mobility since 2009 and did research and some dissertations. One of the, one of the outstanding initiatives in, in Europe and I think uh, with the recent uh, focus and possibilities uh, provided for higher education institutions, it is already, I, I'm confident about saying that it is already a key to the major impact. How? First of all, in um, uh, offer, in, in the development of um, possibilities and outreach and learning provisions for international students, yes, but at the same time, revisiting um, courses and programs that are offered for a virtual exchange uh, with the purpose of 
student collaboration in um, online through online studies uh, through academic and cultural exchange uh, online on uh, certain topics um, and uh, certain certain uh, in certain programs uh, it has impact upon curriculum uh, improvement upon teacher and learner uh, competence and skills improvement, intercultural competences, linguistic skills, uh, uh, digital competences. So actually the impact is, is already um, measured and I believe it will be measured again, uh, but it, it, it has very, very great potential. Um, I would um, uh, only mention one restriction that people usually uh, want to stay with the blended mode. And we hope that we will be able to implement blended mode, that it will not replace uh, physical mobility, but will only enhance it. Uh, as, for example, uh, one of the positive, again, impact is that virtual mobility might prepare some students for physical mobility in advance, uh, getting them possibilities to see how uh, studies are organized in, in a different uh, cultural and academic settings. Just Thank one question, Irina. When you refer to that and you the benefits that it has, do you draw that from actual ongoing collaboration and exchanges that you have, or is that something that is more envisaged uh, and in the planning? We did research on that. Uh, we, I think uh, through three consortia, we have uh, the same questionnaires and the same research instruments that we apply to, to three different contexts teacher virtual mobility, student virtual mobility, and combined virtual mobility. Virtual mobility when um, uh, uh, students are hosted virtually and then sent, so different, different scenarios. And uh, uh, last year, we also shared the same instruments um, with the German um, Dresden Technical University, I think, researchers, so they again reconfirmed uh, and some data came from them. Uh, I, I believe that uh, a lot of cases of virtual mobility uh, experiences were restricted due to administrative costs in the past, but uh, now when international um, uh, offices in universities uh, supported with the funding for virtual mobility, I think this problem is solved. And that's why I'm very, very happy about it. So the main obstacle now is removed for mainstreaming of these possibilities. Okay, okay. I, I, I will not repeat what uh, Irina said because I fully agree uh, with this. I just want to say that even if Belgium is a little country, you, you drive a car during a bit more than one, one hour and you are outside the country. Uh, even if this is the situation of a country, um, I would say that digital uh, activity has really some positive impact on collaboration, not only international, but also national, regional, and even intra-institutional in the university itself. Um, it's not new, degrees uh, co-organized by different institutions, different faculties, um, already exist before COVID, but uh, one of the major obstacles was the logistic management of this collaboration, that it's much more easier to, uh, to, uh, to support that standalone program. So it's clear uh, to me that digital and development of uh, online tools are an opportunity to make possibly life for students easier in these co-organized programs and also uh, make life of the staff, academic as well as administrative staff, easier. So it doesn't mean, as Irina said, that this collaboration have to remain strictly virtual online because experience of sharing local activity uh, remain a, a great source of enrichment for the students, the teachers, but some heavy constraints appear today to be possibly lighter than, than was expected before. So for me, virtual mobility, international or even national, can be further developed. 
but it will hardly compete the experience of an immersion in a different environment with a different culture, language, or tradition. On site activity remain a unique experience for students, I think, and even for the staff. So virtual mobility can be a new normal uh, of inter-university uh, collaborations. And I really like the idea that virtual mobility could prepare to uh, 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 actual mobility. Thank you, thank you. I think there is much more when we're talking about virtual mobility. It can, uh, does it mean just one course? Does it mean just one lecture? Uh, how to move the points, get from one institution to another? So there are lots of issues uh, here to be discussed. Uh, just let me remind you that uh, we have still seven minutes to go. So Michael, please choose the slides you would like to, that we discuss yet, uh, uh, but while we have time. I think we have just one left. I just wanted to um, uh, one one question to you all. Do you see now in the current COVID situation? Do you see that Erasmus uh, student mobility is transferred to virtual? Does that take place? I mean, or is that more exceptional? Or maybe you, you don't know. For us, it's exceptional. The, it's exceptional the goal still. is still to remain uh, yeah. actual mobility. Yeah, and if it's not occurring, it's cancelled most of the time. Yeah. Okay. Good. I can I can say uh, we have prepared for this academic year with our uh, within our European uh, Alliance virtual mobility year, and uh, uh, in our university we financially supported and are we are supporting now about thirty teachers to develop uh, complete online courses with innovative strategies for assessment, because assessment should also be done through this. And within the Alliance, we, we are having at the moment 100 students in virtual mobility, and we are planning to have another 100 in the, in the summer semester. Of course, this will be a starting point. We have limited this, this to these 200 students in order to be able to check for all the aspects of uh, or, or issues that uh, might come up. But we are preparing uh, uh, an Erasmus multilateral uh, agreement between our alliance institutions to be able to promote both physical, virtual, and combined mobility. Uh, thanks. That's interesting to learn. Yeah, yeah. this is one yeah. shiny example from Croatia. Yeah. We are very yeah. happy about that. Yeah. yeah, rightly so. Good. Okay, this can be my last slide. I have one more on uh, COVID-19 impact, but we discussed already quite a bit on that. Um, oh, sorry, no, it's not. Oh, this is the one on strategy. Ah, I forgot about that. Um, and maybe I, we just do that very briefly. So in a nutshell, the results are, there's much more strategies in place. Our feeling are, is also compared to 2014, the strategies have become much more meaningful and useful within the institutions. We can see generally a trend that institutions kind of uh, develop centralized or shared responsibilities for digital learning, which is in sharp contrast to what we saw in 2014, where it was left often to some faculties, even to some individual staff at institutions. So that's the one side. So I think uh, universities really build strategies and structures for digitally enhanced learning. And then what you can also see that uh, involvement and staff and students is, uh, is also widely used. And both strategy and staff plus staff development training, that comes actually out as the three top enablers for digitally enhanced learning at institutions. So it's strategy, staff and student participation and staff development. Uh, and it's only number four is only major investments. So uh, in equipment and infrastructure. So a strong emphasis on staff and strategy and structures. Any comments on that? Uh, just to pick that up, yes, you can see it's different uh, as everything uh, across Europe. Uh, when we look at the 12% of uh, institutions which don't have strategies, uh, you can see it's partly in Southern and Eastern Europe. And interestingly, Belgium is there. Now, 
Philip will tell us that must be Flanders, but uh, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will, I will not say that ju it's just Flanders, but uh, <laughs> maybe. Uh, but I'm I'm optimistic because uh, uh, we have to understand the strategy or QA process is often considered perceived in university as an obstacle to academic freedom, and uh, because in, it's introducing in the higher education institution attitudes and process coming from the business world where objectives profit, efficiency, excellence are not always similar to the ones of education world, critical thinking, blue sky research, and so on. So I think that uh, successful pilot experience, or which will be evidences for the academic world, will make easier the adoption of such plans in the future, adapted to the world of education. And it will improve during the next year, so I'm quite sure. Evidence-based, on you know, Michael, very important. Maybe we can ask Irina and Marta for their opinion and then conclude uh, yeah. uh, with this yes. uh, our session. So, Irina, would you like to comment uh, on this topic as well? Um, well, if if we conclude now, um, I would like to say that. Um, there were um, those uh, institutions, professionals, uh, networks who were discussing um, digitalization and technology enhanced learning uh, for many years and found their own way. But today we, we, we have to rethink what we have. And also there are others joining in into the discussions. I think one of the most beautiful thing would be if um, we have more possibilities um, uh, to meet on national and international level uh, for the open discussions and to revisit uh, existing practices, to take maybe good practices, but to see them in the new light. And I'm sure we would uh, find the need to update many things, uh, to find new ways. I think uh, very important investments already done in, in Europe exist they are also not uh, always visible. So um, uh, revisiting them, bringing them to the new light and uh, bringing very diverse opinions and discussions would be very helpful and um, um, important for all of us. So I think any, any occasion like this and, and others is important and they should not wait for, for long. I think they should start uh, immediately and continue. Thank you very much, Irina. And Marta? Uh, yes, thinking now broadly as a wrap-up of this discussion, I would, I would point here to this uh, uh, phrase on the slide, transformative impact of digital learning or transformative impact of this COVID situation that taught us uh, and, and uh, made clear that uh, digital education or applying of digital tools in education can have very, uh, very numerous uh, positive effects. And we should rely on this uh, positive sides of digitally enhanced learning, but our strategies should focus on support of the academics and support of the students in order to ensure the environment in which students can uh, really um, uh, acquire the, the skills needed for their future. And that is autonomous learning, that is uh, self-organization, that is creativity, innovation, and responsibility for personal development. So I think, as, as we always pointed, digital or uh, uh, digital tools are just the tools, and uh, we should focus our strategies towards this, what I just described. Oh, nicely said, Marta. I'm coming back to you, Michael, for the concluding words. 
Well, I said. think that Marta has summarized it so nicely and I really oh. as well. So um, nothing more to add to that, probably just to thank you because that was really useful um, also for me. Whenever you collect data, you think it gives you the answers, but you always find out it gives you the questions. So thank you for uh, making the data speak. Uh, I think that's very good and I hope we can continue that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you all. I think it's very important to reflect uh, on the data we have and give us the uh, possibility to, to see what we can do better and which direction we should move uh, uh, more. Uh, so I'm very happy that we had this session. Um, so thank you all. Thank you, Irina, Marta, Philip, and Michael. Um, recordings will be available later. Uh, so the Eden European o Online and Distance Learning Week is continuing till the Monday. So we have a few more sessions. Uh, thank you for being with us today and see you uh, this evening already. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Bye-bye.